Before Sandy Hook and before Columbine, there was Lindhurst. In May 1992, Olive Hurst, California, a 20-year-old man armed with a shotgun and a rifle entered his old high school, killed four people, injured 10 more, and held 80 students hostage for eight hours. The reason for this mass killing? One of his former teachers had given him a failing grade. This is what happens when the line between fantasy and reality becomes blurred and a grudge develops into a deadly vendetta. This is the Lindhurst High School shooting. No! Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me. Today's case is an unusual one for me. I don't tend to cover school shootings. And that's just because there is some suggestion that there is a group of, shall we say, individuals who actually like watching this kind of content to get tips. And therefore, it's one of those things that I really consider before I put out into the YouTube universe. But nonetheless, this one really interested me for a whole heap of reasons because mental health is something that obviously is not linked to people killing on the whole with respect. We don't want to stigmatize mental health any further. All of you know my own experience of massive loss due to mental health, but we also need to consider how mental health, if untreated, can add and exacerbate issues and how if we understand fully what's going on for the individual who's going through this kind of experience, there is an opportunity to deflect problematic behavior. So today's case is one of those that I think is really important to explore based on the amalgamation, shall we say, of what can contribute to this kind of horrible situation playing out. Also, if you are new to my channel and you've just stumbled here from the YouTube universe, then I release my content that is crime deep dives on a Wednesday and a Sunday. If you like crime and consistency, this is definitely the channel for you. Also to those of you supporting me on Patreon and my YouTube membership, finally, I'm starting to record some videos just for you guys. So hold tight, hang fire. Thank you for all your support and hopefully it's gonna pay dividends because I'm gonna be working hard to deliver you new unseen content. Let's talk about today's case. First of all, the perpetrator. So Eric Christopher Houston. He's born June 8th, 1971 in Santa Barbara, California, USA. When it's 1992, which is when this crime plays out, he's 20 years of age, he's unemployed and he's also living with his mother and his older half-brother. So arguably, the fact that he isn't working at 20 years of age and is still living with his mum, that suggests potentially he's got some struggles, it might be difficult to find gainful employment, and obviously when people find themselves in situations where they can't get work, it can lead to feelings of abandonment, isolation, feeling cut off from general society, and it means that you don't have the opportunities that other people have, because financially, you just don't have the economy available to you. Now, what I would say is when I was researching Houston's family, there is so much dysfunction. There are so many problems that have happened. So really traumatic events in Houston's family, which could definitely have affected his development. So growing up, his mother, Edith Houston, she had been horribly abused by several members of her family. So her experience of growing up in a safe space, in a safe place, it did not exist. She was somebody who had been violated in ways that no child should be violated. And clearly that's gonna impact on the way that she sees the world. And also it's gonna impact just around her psychological well-being. And that isn't to say that she causes any problems in the relationship with her own children. It's just to acknowledge that the fractures in her foundations would be huge and she absolutely didn't deserve any of those awful things to happen. Now she gets together with Houston's father and he is really unfaithful, he's an alcoholic and it's a really volatile 
relationship apparently they frequently fought but again if you think about the insecurity that she would have experienced and enjoyed in her childhood it's unsurprising that she ends up with somebody who's less than perfect because you have a low bar for relationships when the people around you that you're going to be able to make you feel safe just fail you so enormously now on top of the fact that she's in this horribly volatile relationship houston's maternal uncle he killed three people in a fight how does that even happen? But arguably the amount of violence that would be involved in actually managing to kill three people in one fight is pretty blindsiding. Also, maternal grandmother, she'd taken her own life. So we have suicidality and suicidal reality in the family. And his own mother had actually also thought about ending her life because her marriage had broken down. And let's be honest, when you've been violated horribly by several members of your family growing up, your understanding of safety is going to be fully fractured. Your feelings of self-worth are going to be on the floor. And every further abandonment is probably going to reopen that unresolved trauma. This is something I'm speculating, but I genuinely think it makes sense. Psychologically, we know that attachment that's secure is something that helps us to thrive. But anything that fractures that reality and breaks down that sense of attachment is going to cause trauma. And certainly when you think about what I've just expressed regarding this family, she's going to have so much of that. And unless she was lucky enough to get a lot of professional help and support, which she wasn't, she's not going to necessarily know how to hold all of that and cope in a way that doesn't lead to, shall we say, choosing strategies which are a little bit excessive, such as considering suicide. Now, Houston's father... Obviously, we already know there are problems in the relationship as far as the marriage is concerned. But then when that breaks down, he basically abandons the family. And this is when Houston's a young child. So he's lost a primary role model, an imperfect one. We can all agree with that. But nonetheless, as a child, you're not thinking about the relationship your parents have. You're thinking about where's my dad or where's my mum? And what does that say about me and my meaning? And even though... As a very young child, you haven't got the consciousness and understanding to really explore the reality of the fundamentals of these kind of relationships. You still have a profound understanding that your life might not be the same as your friend's life, for example, because they have a doting parent, a doting dad around. So even though you don't know exactly what's going on, the subtleties of the information that you're gaining around you from just seeing other people's lives mean that often you do feel that abandonment level really early on. And it, it gets worse, really, because he's also quite a sickly child. He's had quite poor health suffered from spinal meningitis, pneumonia, also severe asthma as an infant. And academically, he definitely struggled more than his peers, had problems in school with his learning, found it really difficult to pay attention. He struggled with impulse control, controlling his behaviour was problematic. And then as he grows into an adult, he retrospectively is diagnosed with ADHD. So he's an individual who is obviously facing more challenges than the average child. Ultimately, he gets classified as learning handicapped. Yes, that was how it was described back in the day. Learning handicapped. It's kind of nice that we've evolved our language to be far more respectful, isn't it? But you can imagine how that would feel as well for any child because you don't want to be different. You want to be the same as your peers. You want people to consider you equal. And anything that can impact on that level of equality, it makes you feel different. And when we feel different on top of all of our fractures, then understandably, it can lead to quite challenging internal feelings. Some might be insecurity, but some might be rage. Because why is our life so much more difficult than that of our peers? So ultimately, he gets placed in special education classes. This is during his elementary school, and he remained in those classes during junior and high school. And it seems that as he's progressing through the years at school, his IQ drops significantly. And again, we know that education measures a tiny fraction of intelligence. It's something that's really important to get across. People don't talk about it. We act as if a child who succeeds at school is brighter than a child who fails at school. And it's just completely incongruent with reality. We measure academic values at school. 
of which a small portion of people can succeed amazingly at, but the rest of us will be average. Many of us will be low average. I'm sure a lot of you listening will remember that you'll be below average in certain areas specific to the academic system. But what happens is you leave that system and you often become entrepreneurial, start your own businesses and supersede some of the people that were brightest in your class because the world doesn't work just on academia. It works on social experience, charisma, the ability to engage in emotional relationships, being somebody with entrepreneurial thought, all of these things play in. But at school, it feels like it's the be all and end all. And if your IQ, your intelligence quotient is dropping significantly, then every single year that you're facing a bigger challenge and more challenging academic realities, the more challenging it will be for you full stop because you'll be thinking there is something seriously wrong with me. I can't do what any of my peers can do. And that is such an alienating feeling. And it makes sense that during this period of going through school, he actually likes to hang around with young kids and he enjoys the company of those children who are younger than him far more than his older peers or the peers of his age. And I guess that's for two reasons. One, he probably does relate to them because of his levels developmentally in a way that feels more authentic and easier. And the other thing is he's probably nowhere near as judged because as you get older and people have expectations of you and those expectations fall short because you haven't got the capacity, then you're gonna find yourself stigmatized and often alienated in groups. Now, whilst that's all said that he definitely had learning difficulties, it's well worth noting that there were also actually no issues with his behavior. He wasn't considered violent, he wasn't considered aggressive, he wasn't an individual who went in and disturbed classes. So he's not a child who's standing out in any way behaviorally as dysfunctional. Now, from the age of around 12 to 13, Houston does actually become fascinated with military equipment and firearms. So he often would practice shooting with his half-brother, Ronald Cadell. And during his high school years, this is when we see that his behavior that has not been dysfunctional in any way, shape or form does start to become a little bit more difficult to control. Arguably, we all know that hormones, physiology, brain development is still all kicking in at this point. You're looking at new relationships, you're noticing differences and disparities more in your life. So it is a cooking pot of dysfunction for lots of us when we arrive in our teenage years because we genuinely feel things in an impactful way. We're young, we haven't got the responsibilities yet of the wider world and therefore intensity is something that we endure and sometimes that can lead to some problematic behavior. His mother is really concerned about this, so she actually sends him to live with his father and stepmother in Arkansas, which on one level is understandable, she obviously needs a break, but on the other side, again, it's gonna to add to that level of abandonment and his father isn't exactly the most engaged person. He's not been around for a long time, so it's like being sent to live with a stranger. And it's not long before Houston starts begging basically to be returned home and he said one of the reasons for that was his dad was really strict with him but also his dad drank took heavy drugs and that would mean there is a level of unpredictability in his behavior so it's not a perfect situation for a child with dysfunction to be sent to anyway you want a parent who knows what they're doing not somebody who's just uber strict but then behaviorally acts in a completely incongruent way and it gets high and drunk all the time because that's giving very mixed messages. Now, Houston attends Lindhurst High School, which is in Olivehurst, California. And in his second year of junior high, he's got this history tutor and he's a young tutor called Robert Brenz. Now, at first, he gets on really well with him, thinks he's a really good teacher, but it seems that as he progresses into his senior year, this relationship becomes, as far as he is concerned, incredibly contentious, and it really sours during his senior year. The reason that this is the case is because Houston genuinely believes that Brenz tends to take all of his frustrations out on him. So there are lots of unruly students that he actually is being taught with, but at the end of the day, when it comes down to the disciplining, he will get the brunt of his teacher's annoyances and anger with other students taken out on him. And Houston also goes on to say that he blamed Brenz for literally all the problems that he had in his life. I mean, 
We've all wanted to do that at times, haven't we? Haven't we all? Is it just me? I've always wanted to be able to find somebody to blame for my problems, but you realise down the line that taking accountability and responsibility is on you. But you can understand, can't you, when you're a younger person, that sense of, if only you didn't do A, then I wouldn't feel B. Because you're not yet grown, you're not yet developed, you haven't yet understood that you're the person in charge of solving the issues in your life. And at this moment in time, in these very angsty years, that's his projection. This is all to do with his teacher. And there's a particular reasoning behind his beliefs. So during his senior year, which is 1988-1989, Brennan's had taught civics and economics classes. Now, he passed civics, so Houston was successful there, but he failed his economics. And in Houston's eyes, his teacher had basically denied him. He denied him his high school diploma. He denied him potential future opportunities. He denied him in his belief system, fairness. And from that point on, every single failure, every fallout in his life, he blames on Brens. And the seed is planted. And the thing about a seed being planted is if you don't resolve it, if instead you nurture that seed, you amplify it, you grow it into something that it's far bigger than it ever was, clearly the consequences of that can be problematic. Now I will say there is another reason why Brenz is a problem for Houston because what he says is that this teacher had actually molested him twice in 1989, so this would be when he was around 17 years of age. He alleges, just to put it out there, it's alleged that on one occasion they were alone in the classroom and Brenz had basically rubbed his hand on his crotch and he said after this their student-teacher relationship really started to deteriorate further but there was actually another occasion as well where he said that his teacher put his hand down his pants grabbed his penis and twisted it he said that that caused quite a lot of significant pain now it's got to be noted for balance that Houston didn't report any of this he said he didn't report it because he felt that nothing would actually change, nothing would be done. And I need to stress, these allegations are completely unproven. And don't get me wrong, again, it's really important and imperative to understand that lots of children growing up, they experience molestation and they don't tell anybody about it because they're embarrassed, they're ashamed, sometimes they feel like they're culpable even though all of those things are untrue and they should just be able to acknowledge that nobody has a right to touch them, it is such a murky area when you are growing up because you are dealing with your own sexuality developing, relationships, and it's quite a taboo area and subject, even in a very liberal age that we live in now. So it's not as if a child couldn't go through something truly awful and not report it. That happens every single day of the week, but equally, when you think about the fact that we're dealing with a really serious case where murders occurred, it could also be that a perpetrator wants to minimise their behaviour by allaying responsibility and projecting that reasoning onto somebody else. Now, Houston had a best friend, David Ruetz, and he said, listen, we talked about everything, but he never ever mentioned that he'd been molested by a teacher. But Equally, there was another friend that had actually left high school and he said that Houston had actually told him that a teacher called Robert fondled him and did give him oral sex in exchange for passing a grade. Again, I cannot say whether that's true or otherwise, but arguably, if you had the power to get a teacher to do that for you, the teacher would then be in a very very challenging position because you could report that teacher and if that teacher then refused to move mountains for you to get whatever you wanted you would be in a position where you could extort them to some degree so I'm not saying it doesn't add up abuse is really confusing and this could definitely have happened but we certainly cannot say it did now after leaving high school he hasn't graduated bear in mind Houston goes to a summer school because he wants to attempt to secure a pass in that economics class that he's failed so he can graduate, but he fails again. And he said, the reason that I failed was all down to the psychological trauma that I experienced with the mental strain of the molestation. 
So again, he's using that as leverage to explain the fact that he hasn't made it through the class that he failed at school. Again, with respect, if you have been a victim of serious trauma, sexual abuse, then you are not focusing on education no matter how much you want it on the whole. You are dealing with unresolved levels of fear and pain and shame and all those that go with it. So just to note, it would not be outside of the context we'd expect for somebody to struggle academically when they're dealing with something so enormous emotionally. But like I said, equally, it could just be a place to put all of that discontent by using it as an excuse when he hadn't actually suffered it at all. So up until this point, I would say that in spite of the fact that there were lots of warning signs and red flags, Houston hadn't actually ever been diagnosed with any mental health problems. But when they've reflected on who he was and what he'd done and where he'd arrived at, they believe that he was somebody who was suffering from an organic brain syndrome. Now that's a form of permanent brain damage and this would cause a disturbance in consciousness, cognition, mood effect and behaviour. Also, he would end up being diagnosed with a developmental disorder and that's a manifestation of behaviour that means there'll be delayed mental development. Also, a dependent personality disorder and that would be linked to really high levels of anxiety, feelings of helplessness and also borderline personality disorder and that's a condition that I suppose is manifested by extreme mood swings. Now, again, particularly with BPD, we see a high link to trauma. Now that would suggest that he was dealing with unresolved trauma from childhood, or that he had indeed experienced traumatic situations and not had any help managing those. So there is a lot going on there within his mental state, and we could definitely say that his contact with reality was potentially unstable. When he's 16, he actually does attempt to take his own life, and that is such a serious reaction, isn't it? And a severe reaction to unmanageable feelings emotionally. We cannot underestimate the gravity of a 16 year old who genuinely feels that it is gonna be more beneficial to end their life than to resolve their issues. And they must be carrying around a really huge emotional burden to do that. And one of the motivators that seems to have contributed to this decision to just escape reality on a permanent level is he was having issues with his sexuality. So he felt guilty about these quasi homosexual seeking behaviors um, directed towards his best friend in particular, Ruerts. So they had got to that stage where they were figuring out who they were. And he was obviously having quite strong feelings towards him, but it's such a tricky area, isn't it, when you're a kid? You know, you don't want to offend your friend, you don't want to upset your friend, you don't want to expose yourself when you feel that letting them know about your sexuality could be tricky for you and might end up with them rejecting and abandoning you. You know, it's one of those steps that you take and you can't go back on and that can lead to some really challenging episodes if those feelings aren't represented and reflected. So at 16, he's dealing with this really challenging period due to that sexuality consideration and exploration. Now they did experiment sexually with each other at least on one occasion in 1991. This is when he was 19 years of age. And apparently the two did often talk about sexual matters. So it's not that he gets abandoned by his friend, but it does feel that there is a level of discomfort that he feels around his potential homosexuality. Now, at one point, Houston had actually dated Ruart's ex-girlfriend, and this did upset Ruart because apparently he wanted an exclusive sexual relationship with Houston. So again, we've got this complexity where Houston doesn't quite know where he fits. Is it that he's straight? Is it that he's bi? Is it that he's gay? But clearly, there was a relationship opportunity there with Ruer, who obviously did have deep feelings with him. But like I said, when you're dealing with that confusion and complexity, it is something really challenging because you haven't got the years behind you to feel grown enough at times to deal with what we're talking about. And we have to remember we're back in the early 90s at this point. It's not where the world is today. 
the idea that homosexuality was just accepted is something that is a modern phenomenon. Even now, as we know, in places like the Middle East and in certain very religious orders, you are not accepted if you are homosexual. But for the most part in general society and liberal society, of course, rightly so, you are. But the 90s wasn't like that. So you're also dealing with the social stigma and that adds to the psychological confusion and a feeling that there is something not necessarily right about you. So he would be dealing with all this conflict. And again, that's gonna to add to the psychological distress we've also looked at so far. It's also worth noting that as a young child, apparently he would dress up in women's clothing. And this is something that later down the line, they identified as having added to his sexual identity confusion. And they also feel that even though it seems like a tenuous link, this could possibly have been something that led to this fascination with firearms, because ultimately it's a very masculine thing to do, isn't it? You know, I like wearing dresses. It turns me on wearing dresses, or I feel more at home wearing dresses, but I don't think that's acceptable. I don't think that's masculine. I don't think that's correct. So I'm going to get really involved in firearms because that's the most male I can be. And, it's such a juxtaposition, isn't it? And the reality is that maybe he's trying his best to behave as he believes a true man would behave. Again, giving us more insight into that confusion and fear and shame that he may be carrying. Now, after he fails to graduate, that was in 1989, Houston actually signs on with a temping agency because he wants to work. He got a short-term contract working on an assembly line for Hewlett Packard, but then in early 1992, his contract actually expires. He had been, to note, an excellent employee. In fact, his manager said he was so good at what he did, he would, without a shadow of a doubt, have offered him a permanent position, but it wasn't possible. Because even though he was taken on as a temp and he did the job perfectly to a point where he exceeded expectations, he didn't have a high school diploma. And where does that go back to? That goes back to blaming his teacher, Brenz, for failing him. So this is again another massive abandonment for him. Suddenly, he's in a situation where he's been loving doing a job, he's done it really well, he's had a high sense of value, he's been an individual who has exceeded targets and has been recognised for this. This has been helpful for his security, his sense of self, his self-esteem, and then suddenly it's over. And it's nothing to do with how he's acted. It's nothing to do with his failures in work. It's purely to do with this technicality that he can't have a permanent contract unless he has his high school diploma. So suddenly that seed of discontent that was already growing has now flourished and full throttle Brenz is as far as he is concerned, the reasoning for his life falling apart. And people said that you could literally see that this was the point that Houston's personality just changed. So he isolates himself, starts to spend a lot of time by himself. He seemed really depressed, but also he starts with this genuinely open, volatile behavior. So we've seen dysfunction as he's become a later teenager. He has been more behaviorally problematic, which he wasn't in his early years, but suddenly it's like the tip of the iceberg has been seen prior to this. And now we're seeing the true capacity where he just loses his rag really often because he's so fraught and rageful about how his life has suddenly taken a turn. Now, up until this point, he'd never been in trouble with the police before, but he starts drinking, he starts smoking marijuana, and I think just add drug use and alcohol use to fractures and foundations. You know, when we're thinking about the pen portrait of possibility about what creates these individuals, certainly that's gonna cause a bigger fracture to a mental state that's already problematic. And his mum said that he was also taking harder drugs at this time. So we've gone from seeing somebody who's relatively law abiding in spite of his problems to being somebody who seems a little bit more out of control. And according to Houston, this is when his thoughts become really distorted. He starts hearing Bren's voice in his head. That's when he's awake. It's also when he's asleep. So he's got these intrusive voices. Also, he said that he heard people laughing at him and there were these voices in his head that were commanding him to go back to his high school. 
So clearly, this is mental distress. Now, these intrusive thoughts are going to be very distressing, but also it introduces us to possible psychosis. So the drugs themselves can induce that. But when you think about the kind of individual that we're talking about, this could lead to some really problematic results. And apparently it's around this time he starts to formulate a plan. And what that plan was, he wanted to take Bren's hostage and he wanted to expose the evils of the school system. And I guess when you think of it in that context, the rage that he feels towards his teacher, the psychological distress he believes he's caused him, when you think about the consequences of what he's talking about there, yes, that would be incredibly traumatic for the teacher, but ultimately he'd survive, and ultimately it feels like there is a political belief behind it, which is, I don't think the school system has worked effectively for me, I want to expose this, and even though it's completely immoral to take somebody hostage, it doesn't mean that you cannot acknowledge the motivator behind it and the motivator behind it which is to expose a system that fundamentally fails lots of people well there is some kind of understanding that i can lend myself to actually understand that position but like i said the hostage situation that's illegal and that's going to be very problematic but he's also not talking about murdering anybody at this moment in time so in the weeks leading up to may 1992 what I would definitely say is that Houston's behaviour becomes incredibly erratic. So he didn't eat very much, he stayed up really late all the time, and he was regularly handling his firearms. So that is a recipe for disaster anyway. If you're not sleeping, it's really problematic on our psyche and psychological well-being, it causes a great deal of distress. Those of you with insomnia know that. But also the eating little. So it sounds to me almost manic because when you're not hungry, it tends to be that physiologically something is going on. And if you're not sleeping, something physiologically is going on. And we see this in periods of mania. He becomes more and more obsessed as well with this plan to just return to his high school and to get this revenge. He wants retribution. And it feels like because he is spending so much time fixating on that original plan to take Bren's hostage, that it stops being enough it's almost like he desensitizes himself to that original plan and he wants to up the ante. So it seems at this point, Houston and his best friend Ruiz, they start discussing going to Lindhurst High School and they start talking about carrying out a shooting. Now, Houston at this point even says there are a couple of people that he'd like to shoot, even read passages from a book on military tactics and police procedures to Ruiz. So he's really engaged with this now. It's not just about a fantasy, he's actually starting to create markers of possibility. Bear in mind, one of the most worrying pieces of the puzzle being that Houston's already in possession of the necessary weaponry. So he's got a shotgun and two 22 caliber semi-automatic rifles. He was even that advanced in how to handle these guns that he could cock his pump action shotgun with one arm. So he's adept at using these. Now, as far as Ruiz is concerned, they're just having a laugh, just idle fantasy. This isn't real. They're just talking about what they would do in a universe where that was something that they could get away with. And he's not engaged with it in a way where he thinks that reality could ever play out. But for Houston, the line between fantasy and reality has become blurred. And what he was planning was way more than just talk. In the weeks leading up to May 1992, he even visited the school on a recce. Now, this is a really serious indicator because he's taken it from fantasy into physicality. He's visited the school. And when you've visited the school, you're creating steps towards activating that reality. It's not in his head anymore. He's actually gone and done something physical about this. Now, Houston says at that point, he wasn't really planning to hurt anyone. He just wanted to start blowing stuff up. Might wing a couple of people to get the media's attention. That's more of a, I want people to know who I am. I want people to see my potential, but I'm actually not going to do anybody any terrible harm. But of course, just as the fantasy has become physical, the physical is going to shift from this kind of belief to something far more sinister far more grave for everybody involved. We get to Friday the 1st of May 
1992. At this point, Houston takes eight or nine caffeine pills, drinks four or five cups of coffee, which is obviously going to impact on him physiologically. He said later, after this all plays out, that I'm going to describe that that particular day he'd been hearing voices all day just telling him to go to the school, inciting him to go. Now, the night before, he'd actually sawn off the stock of his rifle. And the reason for that is it makes it smaller and more manoeuvrable. So, in spite of the fact he's hearing voices the day that this incident is going to take place, it feels like he's been prepping and preparing before this point. And he's kind of set the sights of what's going to play out. So invariably, this is premeditated, no matter what kind of mental state we're talking about. Now, before he leaves the house, he actually waits for his unemployment benefits to arrive. And the reason for that is he needs money to buy ammunition. Then he went ahead and he made a shopping list and he actually went out to buy the things he needed to carry out his plan. Now, again, people suffer from psychotic breaks. I have nursed, lived, loved and lost an individual who fits that paradigm. Let me tell you, his thinking was never in a linear, logical fashion. So when I think about my personal experience of psychosis and the people that I've worked with with psychosis, I very rarely get a type of thinking that is logical. That's the reason it's psychotic thinking. But this guy is writing a list, understanding exactly what he needs to buy, and then going out and achieving it that does not feel like he's enduring some kind of break from reality. And he goes out and he buys a number four bookshop ammunition, 22 caliber ammunition, and also an ammunition pouch. The bookshop ammo he purchased, wow, I looked that up and what can you say? It is highly lethal. So it's anti-personnel ammunition and it's got this devastating impact powder. Each shell contains around 24 projectiles and the diameter of their spread expanded one inch for every yard travelled. So you can imagine the catastrophic impact of one of those bullets. Now, what makes it more of a juxtaposition is the day that he's going to do this, it is absolutely this beautiful spring day. You know, this perfect, beautiful weather. And all those experiencing it couldn't have envisaged for even a millisecond how that day is going to end, which is in carnage. So around 1.50 p.m., Houston parks his car, enters the grounds at Lindhurst High School. He is dressed in army clothes and with camouflage paint on his face. Again, he's projecting an image that does not, in my view, make him seem like he's having a psychotic break because he's planning the way that he looks. In the pockets of his camouflage vest, he had shotgun shells and he also had two shoulder belts and an ammunition belt that was just full of bullets. He was carrying a shotgun, he had a rifle slung over his back and as he's walking towards the school building C, a teacher actually spots him and I think she's really brave actually because she just wanders over to him and notes that he's got all these weapons on him and that he also seems to have this purposeful stride. And she says, do you have a permit for those firearms? Now, apparently he just looked at her and carried on walking. He later claimed that this is the moment that he just decided to change his plan. He wasn't just going to blow stuff up. He was going to shoot people. Again, that just seems like a real excuse. Oh, some woman came over and challenged me about the fact that I was literally walking around with ammunition and guns all over me. And she asked me about that and that made me decide, well, I'm going to kill everybody. That's just an excuse, isn't it? As simple as that. But that teacher, you do kind of think she kind of was lucky to escape with her life because challenging somebody in that moment, that could have tipped him over the edge to acting immediately as opposed to doing what he finally goes on to do. Now, after he enters building C, Houston walks into classroom 108. And in classroom 108, there's just a group of unsuspecting students who are having a history lesson with the teacher. But of course, that teacher is the object of this killer's attention. That's 28-year-old Robert Brenz. Now, bear in mind, this classroom of students are completely unprepared. And we have a 17-year-old senior, Rachel Scarberry. She's just sitting in a chair. She sees Houston and she just thinks it's a joke. 
she actually thought that the shotgun was just a paintball gun. She's going to be the first person to get shot. She gets hit in the chest. She gets hit in the right arm. But thankfully, divine intervention, call it what you will, she survives. Houston's next target wouldn't be so lucky, though, because he turns his attention on the object of his frustrations, his former teacher, and he shoots Brenz at close range in the chest. Brenz falls, critically injured, bleeding to death. Houston then walks towards him. But then he turns around and then he shoots this student, Judy Davis, who's just sitting in a chair. She takes the full force of the blast in her face, in her upper chest, and she is killed instantly. The horror is now unfolding in the class. The students are realising this is real. Two other students, Thomas and Ajostai and Tracy Young, they're also shot and injured. Thomas is hit in the ear and shoulder as he dives to the floor and Tracy is hit in the foot as she dives for cover. She actually loses two of her toes because she's so badly injured by that gunshot. Houston then removes himself from this classroom and it's chaos. The kids are processing what's played out. Their teacher is lying dead on the floor. Another student, a friend of theirs, is lying dead on the floor. Some of them have been horribly injured. This has happened in moments. They don't know when he's coming back, if he's coming back. Absolute terror, horror. He just casually walks down the hallway. Then he stops, fires three times into classroom 105. He injures three more students. Jose Rodriguez was hit in the feet. Patricia Calazzo and Miria Yanez, they're both shot in the knees. Can you imagine the pain? the shock, the immobilization of that situation. And it's just come from absolutely nowhere. Houston then goes to classroom 107. Inside we've got 19 year old student, Jason Edward White. He's a huge Garth Brooks fan. And apparently one of the things that was a USP about this guy is because he was just so into Garth Brooks, he would walk around wearing Western clothing and a cowboy hat, a real individual a real unique child. And bear in mind, he's really close in age to Houston, so he actually knew who Houston was. And bear in mind at this point, all the students have heard that there are gunshots, so they know what is playing out. They suspect that this is really dire. They're hiding under the desks. So Jason had got out of his chair and he was moving along the wall when Houston appears in the doorway and shoots him. He shoots him in the right side of the body and that poor boy dies literally minutes later, just bleeds out. Then Houston passes classroom 109. He shoots at student Sergio Martinez. Now, they were hiding in the corner, and that hit Sergio in his left arm. His arm went completely numb, but he didn't even realise he'd been hit until he'd managed to flee the school. We see that when there's quite catastrophic impact through something like a gunshot, your body goes into a situation where it floods the body with cortisol, adrenaline, and it stops the pain. Often it clots the area so you don't bleed out as well. But it's very common that people don't even know that they've been hurt, and in this case, he didn't. Then student Danita Gibson, she's in classroom 110. She's with a substitute teacher, 61-year-old John Kays. They've heard the shots, they've gone into the hallway to investigate, to figure out what on earth is playing out. Danita sees Houston. She turns, she runs, but he shoots her in her buttocks. She's wounded. She manages to get back into the classroom. Houston then focuses his attention. Now he's successfully shot her on the teacher. And according to John, he has this slight smile on his face, almost a spring to his step. Houston shoots him once, hits him in the face, the shoulder and the neck, and John is badly injured, he's clutching his neck, he's bleeding, but he manages to make it back into the classroom. Several students at this point are terrified of what they're seeing, this injured teacher, so they run from the room, they're just thinking about flight mode, how do I escape? Student Wayne Bogus follows, but then stops, because there is another student in harm's way. The witness says, after he'd tried to get this student out of harm's way. He just seems to freeze in the doorway as if in a daze. And Houston approaches him. And in spite of this student just being almost trapped, caught in the headlights, 
it doesn't afford him any sympathy because Houston just points the gun at blank range at his face and shoots him. Force of the shot launches him into the air, he lands on his back, apparently moaning. His body was convulsing. John Kays, who'd been badly injured at this point, he actually later managed to crawl from the building. He was hospitalised for a week, but at least he survived. From Classroom 102, student Angela Welsh has seen Wayne get shot. She was with another student, 16-year-old Bayman Hill. Angela freezes as Houston appears at the doorway. He makes eye contact with her, raises his gun, takes aim at her. Bowman shouts, no, pushes her out of the way. Bowman undoubtedly saved Angela's life. He's an utter hero. But in doing so, he took the full blast of the gunshot to the side of his head, critically injured. Gunshot pellets having entered his brain, his brain stem. Somehow, despite this, they estimate that he actually lived for about half an hour before succumbing to his terrible injuries. But that boy died an absolute hero. He sacrificed his life for the life of another student. What an incredible individual. How rare are these people? And what a loss to our society. What a loss of life. What a loss to his family. Somebody so pro-social, so sacrificial that the reason another person is living and breathing is down to his actions. After the shooting students in the classroom 104, Houston then goes up to the next floor. Now he claims at this point that the voices in his head have now fell silent. So he doesn't actually, from this point on, shoot anyone else. Houston enters classroom 204, tells the teacher to leave, orders all of the students to get to one side of the room before telling them to barricade the doorway with a bookshelf. Can you imagine how horrified and terrified these individuals are? They've heard shooting. They're probably aware that people have been killed. And now this man armed with all this weaponry, with the capacity and potential to kill all of them, is demanding that they barricade themselves in the room with him. He then sends a student to classroom 104 and says, bring back any students with him. Says he won't shoot them but basically tells him, bring them back here. I want them in this classroom. The remaining teachers were ordered to leave the building whilst the remaining students were rounded up in classroom 204. In total, there were over 80 student hostages. Now, by this time, the police are obviously on the scene and this begins an eight hour standoff. Using an intercom, Houston's able to actually communicate with the officers, tells him it's an act of revenge for Bren's failing him said that this is why he'd lost his job, why he'd lost his girlfriend, it was ruining his life. And then he sends a student to get a radio and Houston actually listens to what's playing out in the news. So he's listening to the reports. Now, according to witnesses, he actually seemed really surprised that he'd shot so many people. And disturbingly, while smiling, he tells these students that he shot Brens in the ass but then says he didn't intend to kill anyone. Bear in mind, we're talking about people who've been shot at point blank range. Of course he intended to kill people, no matter what his surprise is suggesting. Meanwhile, on the floor below, we actually have Robert Brenz lying, bleeding to death in his classroom. So the mismatch between what Houston is displaying and discussing versus what's played out in reality is completely distinct. Now, the FBI bring in hostage negotiators and they start to be able to kind of talk gently with Houston, cajole him into releasing many of the students he was holding. And after he's provided with a key to the restroom, Houston starts to be quite humanity orientated, I suppose, after what we just considered he's done. So he lets the students use toilet in pairs and he does threaten and say, look, if you don't come back, I'm going to kill everyone. Now, most did come back because the idea of leaving your friends to potentially encounter a certain death at the hands of this killer is going to be motivation enough for you to return. But unsurprisingly, some took the opportunity to escape. Some people were thinking, I'm not going to be considering other people in that class. I'm considering my own future. So a pair of students were actually sent to the toilet. They didn't return. Houston then sent another pair of students to look after them. 
they didn't return either. They just got out as fast as possible. And I guess people have different judgments of that. Some people will think, why would you chance these other individuals all being murdered because you wanted to look after your own life? But we all know that when we're in a situation of absolute terror, fear, when we're provided with an opportunity to escape, often you'll take that because you're not thinking about anybody other than yourself and the people that you love. Now, in total, around 23 students managed to escape during the course of that night. So these are trickling out. The number of hostages is getting less. And then Houston did actually release another 15 as a sign of good faith during the negotiations. Also, people who were particularly ill or those who were just totally freaking out, they were allowed to leave. And according to witnesses, when this is all going on, he was apparently quite polite but he did have occasional mood swings. He had occasional outbursts, which must have been absolutely terrifying for those individuals that he was keeping. Because if somebody starts to act in a way that's completely irrational, you think, my God, he could start loading that gun and kill us. It's simple as that. Now, around 6 p.m., another 20 are released and this is in exchange for pizzas sodas and also ibuprofen which is all in line with houston's demands so we'll give you something if you give something back to us and again it feels like this gradual decreasing in hostages that also seems to fit i would say with the gradual decreasing of rage that he's feeling you know maybe he's coming to terms with what he's done he knows there's no way out and he's trying to ingratiate himself to some degree to the negotiators who are helping him to come to this conclusion that this needs to end now during the negotiations houston does actually inquire about the condition of those people they had shot and the fbi are very clear they don't want to inflame the situation so the negotiators basically lie and they say oh no one was killed and so the reasoning for this is they want to suggest to him that he's only going to be looking at like five years in a minimum security prison which when you think about if he knew that he was actually going to be charged with first degree murder on multiple levels it's likely that he would have more to lose by potentially leaving the situation than maybe ending his own life and also he has been suicidal before so potentially he could take his own life and it could also amplify the negative behavior again meaning that he thinks well i may as well kill all these other people because i'm either going down forever i'm getting the death sentence or i'm killing myself so i have nothing to lose so it is a clever tactic and i think an effective tactic to say hey you've not done anywhere near the damage you thought you were going to do and you're not looking at the rest of your life being ruined to just get those people out safely now we get to approximately 10 40 p.m at this point houston finally releases the last 20 hostages and he apparently was expressing shock at his actions. He was apologizing to them. And then he leaves his weapons in the classroom and he goes out and he surrenders to the authorities. But that's all too late, isn't it? Because three students are dead and one teacher is dead. And a further nine students and a teacher have been wounded. Inside the school, officers had already begun searching the classrooms in Classroom 108. They find the teacher, Robert Brenz, and student Judy Davis. They're both dead. In the middle classroom 102, they find Beeman Hill's body. Outside classroom 110, they find Wayne Bodes critically injured, having been shot in the face at point blank rage. Incredibly, he was still breathing, still making sounds. He spent seven days in a coma, but against all the odds, he survived and he was really recognised as being a hero, a civil air patrol cadet already. He receives a medal of valour for his heroic actions that day and the nickname Miracle Kid. But things weren't miraculous for him from that day onwards. His life was derailed because of the physical and the mental trauma of his injury. Later, he'd become estranged from his friends and his family. He'd end up in prison. And chain of causation, sliding doors moment. His life changed and altered forever. He's a victim of a long-term trauma and the resulting reality is that it totally ruins his life. In classroom 107, they find Jason's body, a large pool of blood beneath him, beneath his head. His cowboy hat was next to him. Autopsies would later reveal that every single one of his victims has suffered just devastating internal 
and external injuries from those close range shotgun blasts. When they searched Houston's home, investigators basically found a shopping list for the shooting along with a document that was entitled Mission Profile, featured a sketch of the school blowing sea. They also found a note to his family which read, I know parenting had nothing to do with what happens today. It seems my sanity has slipped away and evil took its place. The mistakes, the loneliness and the failure have built up too high. Also, I just want to say I love my family very, very much. Again, when you listen to that, it's premeditated. He knows somebody's going to find that. He has a full expectation that they're going to realise that he'd written this, thinking about what he was about to do. And again, he talks about being, shall we say, less than sane, but he's very cogent in the way he expresses himself. And it's also notable that he wants to let people know it's not his family. He doesn't want to have them blamed because he understands that that's what society does a lot because you're looking for why did this happen? What occurred in this child's life to play out in such a grotesque manner as they grow into early adulthood? And so he's trying to deflect blame from his family to protect them. Now, prior to the trial, obviously, they evaluate him. So psychiatrists, psychologists speak to him. They want to establish his mental state at the time of the shootings. So there's one expert that concludes that in addition to all the other mental disorders that I talked about earlier on, that Houston was also likely suffering from psychotic paranoid schizophrenic disorder. Now that's a very serious mental illness. It's considered a brain disease and clearly that would make his reality feel very distorted at certain times. They also established that he had post-traumatic stress disorder and that could potentially be down to him being molested if those claims were true. He also seemed to have a disassociative reaction to the shootings, so he appeared to have suppressed some of the memories and realities of what played out. And in some instances, he didn't even seem to acknowledge that he'd even been involved in what had happened, and that is another classic symptom of PTSD. So this expert found that his combination of mental illnesses and PTSD meant that at the time of the shootings, he was potentially detached from reality. So basically living in an unreal world. And because he'd had these visual and auditory hallucinations, they were something that didn't just plague him prior to prison, but apparently they plagued him whilst he was in prison awaiting trial. So there was a level of consistency with these supposed breaks from reality. Now these findings, they were actually similar to those of another court appointed expert. They found that Houston was potentially experiencing saviour syndrome, so that he was delusional and he had these delusions of grandeur, that he was carrying out these instructions because a higher power had demanded that he do so. And also they concluded that at some point, Houston had actually suffered brain damage on the left hemisphere. And they linked that back potentially to the spinal meningitis that it had during childhood. And it was believed that this particular damage to the brain had impaired his ability to understand orally conveyed information, which then combined with his ADHD explained his earlier academic difficulties and that drop in IQ. So the defence expert did actually conclude that the insanity defence was open to Houston. They said that whilst he was actually aware of the nature and the quality of his actions during the shootings, due to his psychotic disassociative state, he was basically incapable of distinguishing right from wrong. But the prosecution expert, well, they felt very differently. <laughs> They concluded that Houston was aware of his actions and that they were both legally and morally wrong at the time of the shootings and that he was fully aware of that. But the thing about defence and prosecution is this is how the experts work. The prosecution expert comes in and says they absolutely knew exactly what they were doing, they're totally sane. And then you have the defence expert comes in and goes, no, they knew nothing about what they were doing because of A, B and C. So I always feel like it's a stalemate situation. It comes down to what the jury is going to believe, obviously, in that scenario. But arguably, it's stalemate because 
one will cancel out the other and it comes down to who is going to buy into the belief system will the jury think that the defense is coming out with an expert that's actually credible and making sense or will they feel that retribution is more important in this moment and that they can find the individual sane because their actions have been so reprehensible either way I'll leave it up to you to decide what you personally think as to whether this was an individual who was struggling mental health wise or whether they were somebody fully aware of their faculties and just wanted notoriety and also to get that sense of revenge on somebody that they believe had led to their life going south, shall we say. We get to September 1993 and this is where the jury have to decide whether they believe in the insanity plea and they don't. They reject the insanity defence and Houston's found guilty of four counts of first degree murder and also 10 counts of attempted murder. So the worst of the worst, they're finding him completely culpable for the most serious and extreme crimes. We get to the 20th of September, 1993, 22 year old Houston is sentenced to death for the killings. In 2012, the California Supreme Court upheld his death penalty. He's now aged 51. He remains on California's death row in San Quentin State Prison. He's been there for the last 30 years. So he's still not been put to death. And he's had more of a lifetime than any of those kids whose lives he took. Even when you consider the age of his teacher, Houston has actually lived longer, albeit on death row. This is such a tragic case. I mean, Houston evidently had mental health issues. We can all agree with that. And his life certainly seemed to spiral downhill. Whether he was molested by his teacher, we'll never know. But what I'd say is, Robert Bren's memory has been really tainted with this accusation. He's never been here to give his version of events and his own personal account. He was brutally murdered by Houston. And even if the worst case scenario is that Houston had been abused by him, then murdering him was not the correct consequence. It's as simple as that. I think we can all agree that this killer did lose his grip on reality, he blamed everything, for example, that was wrong with his life on Brens. But in seeking revenge against what he saw as this corrupt school system, he took the life of a young teacher, killed doing his job, and he stole the futures of three students who literally had everything to live for and invariably affected and traumatized the lives of so many others. And that is unforgivable, no matter which way you look at it, whether you choose to believe that the insanity defense and plea should have been allowed, or whether you just see him as a cold-blooded killer. The real victims in this case are not Houston. I'd love to know your thoughts on this particular case. I appreciate it's one of those that is evocative of so many challenging emotions. I would be interested to know whether you feel that the sentencing you believe they got correct or whether you're an individual who thinks that maybe he should have got life without parole or maybe you're somebody who thinks that potentially he should have been sent to a mental health unit for the rest of his days. Either way, what we really need to focus and concentrate on is the legacy that we must always hold on to for the individuals who are victims because Again, we have seen the repetition of these kind of shootings play out again and again and again. And that means there is work to do, both on a mental health level, maybe on a guns regulation level, and certainly on a way that we teach young people to express their emotions constructively is such an important requirement to try to prevent these kind of things playing out again and again. Leave a comment, let me know your own thoughts. If you've got more information about this case, I would love to hear. I hope it's one that I've at least given you a little bit more information about if you didn't know it. It's not as well known as the other school shootings. And like I said, I'm usually reticent to do these, but because of the mental health link and the fact that the insanity plea was rejected, I thought it was a really interesting one to tell you. Take care guys, be safe. And let's remember, the only victims in this case are the ones that I've talked about losing their lives and those affected by the trauma. Houston, He's still alive, he's still being fed, he's still being looked after. And whether he'll die on death row or otherwise, we don't know. Because as you all know, there are stops put on all of these situations right now at the moment. And that might mean that he gets another 20 years. Maybe he'll die of natural causes inside. 
that's something that certainly none of his victims were afforded the opportunity to have play out in their world. Take care, be safe.